Tonight, I've got a wonderful story for you. We, we've been doing some history moments here uh, about country music because that's an important part of the heritage that we're trying to preserve. Uh, the trust is not just things about us, but it's the intangibles, the music that we have loved over the centuries from back in Ireland and Scotland that came over with our pioneers. And we've loved that music, and that's why we play it here on Saturday nights. Well, one of the important people in that regard is Doc Watson. How many people have ever heard Doc Watson and know about Doc Watson? Good. I don't have to explain a lot to you there. Well, his, he came from the same Scots immigrants that came here to this area in the late 1790s. Doc Watson's family dates back to 1790 when Tom Watson, a Scots pioneer, homesteaded 3,000 acres just the other side of Roan Mountain in today's Watauga County, North Carolina. Doc was born near Deep Gap in Stony Fork on March 3rd, 1923, and that became his home for the rest of his life. Blinded before he was a year old by an eye infection, he still mastered most stringed instruments. Can you imagine that? Becoming best known for in introducing a flat picking style that brought the acoustic guitar out of the background as a rhythm instrument into the foreground as a leading role in traditional bluegrass country and roots music. Watson credited his father with teaching him that his blindness shouldn't keep him from living a productive life, and did he ever. His father worked him uh, on a two-man saw, showed him that he could do things. He made him a banjo from the skin, uh, the head of the banjo from the skin of a family cat. <laughs> and, uh, and apparently, it, it was really good, very resonant. <laughs> by, the time, by the time Watson was 12, he had graduated to a store-bought guitar, and a career was born. Doc's big career break came in 1953 when he was invited to join a country and western swing band here in Johnson City. He learned to play fiddle tunes on both the electric and the acoustic guitar when the band played for square dances. The unique flat picking style that he developed made him a hero during the, uh, during the folk boom. He appeared at the Newport Folk Festival to great acclaim in 1963 and again in 1964. He played across the country and around the world from Carnegie Hall to Tokyo to flatbed trucks in North Carolina. Often with great musicians like Bill Monroe, Earl Scruggs and Ricky Skaggs. He was a beloved, intelligent, witty, down-to-earth gentleman who loved to share the music of his heart and his home. His concerts were filled with hot, flat-picking tunes, slow, romantic ballads, gutsy blues numbers, and finger-picked melodies, each song sung with an unmatched clarity, each tune played with a dexterity that was uniquely Doc Watson's, which made him a, a name in the music uh, history books. Doc is especially remembered for the years that he toured with his son, Merle, who shared his talent. After Merle was tragically killed in a tractor accident in 1985, did some of you remember that probably? Doc founded Merle Fest, which has become one of the largest music festivals in the country. Over 75,000 people attended each year over in Wilkesboro, North Carolina. It's a, it's a fundraiser for the Wilkes uh, Community College over there. And all kinds of wonderful names and music attend every year. And this year, how many know about the Roan Street Ramblers? Have heard them? They've been invited to play at Merrill Fest this year. And they kind of, we kind of feel a, a part of their development. They got kind of started here with us in some ways and they're just doing great. You can look them up on, uh, on YouTube. By the time of Doc's death in May 2012, he had recorded or been featured in almost 40 albums. He was awarded eight Grammys, held an honorary doctorate from the University of North Carolina in Asheville, and received the North Carolina Award and the National Medal of, Ar National Medal of the Arts, and was inducted into the International Bluegrass Music Hall of Honor. But what you may not know about Doc Watson was his strong Christian faith. He told about it often, in his own words and in interviews, and I'll quote some of this. Watson said that the gospel album that he did on Praying Ground 
is a collection of the gospel songs he heard over the years, beginning as a child in church. He said he was moved to do gospel songs because I'm certainly a believer. I think if it wasn't for my faith in Jesus, I wouldn't be here, honestly. About the time I was 14, I went through the motions of church, went to the altar, was baptized, so I considered myself a Christian. I knew God was the creator of all things. I thought I could live like a Christian, but I was never convicted enough to get on my knees and find the one I really needed to be changed. In 1966, my son Merrill drove me to help the Flatten Scruggs team to do an album. While I was there, I woke up in the middle of the night with a pain that I thought was food poisoning. The next day, I went to see Earl Scruggs' doctor and found that I had a ruptured appendix. After the operation, the surgeon said, we don't know for sure whether this was successful or not, but you'll know in three days. <laughs> so <laughs> I went into the isolation ward, and from what I could tell, what I heard, I was going to die. I said, Lord, I thought I'd been a Christian all these years, but you know I'm not. Please forgive me of all my sins. I know I'm going to die. I don't want to be lost. Even so, I was afraid to make a commitment then to him personally that I thought I couldn't keep. But four and a half years later, I was listening to a Randy Travis album song called Dr. Jesus. Any of you heard that song? Some of the words are, Lord, I need you to mend my heart and save my soul. There's so many out there who need you. Do you think you could work me in? I listened to that song about five or six times. And the last time I realized I needed that doctor just like Randy did. Then something happened to me that had never happened before. Till then, I didn't quite understand what coming to Christ meant. But this simple song told me what it was. I called on Jesus, and the door was opened. I was able to find the love of Jesus Christ and have his love enter my heart by the Holy Spirit. In my heart, I've been a different man since then. Even though I, it wasn't until I heard Randy's preaching in that song and it unlocked the door of my own salvation, the Lord had been guiding me all along and leading me in the right direction. We'll never know until we get to heaven the full understanding of all the things that happen in our lives. I don't deserve what he did for me. Even though I'd hurt him, he pulled me out of, the, out of death's jaws. And he's done that for millions. He's such a wonderful savior and a wonderful friend. Every sermon, in my opinion, should end with an altar call, fully explaining the tender, sweet love of Jesus Christ that leads us to salvation. That's a testimony of Doc Watson.